Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 11, Lisp. So I uh, started the new job out here in California, and uh, yeah. people, people are so much healthier out here. It's, it's a little depressing, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I think it's, I'm, I'm kind of trying to wane you down, but it's only a matter of, wear you down, but it's only a matter of time before uh, you'll be playing Ultimate Frisbee and, uh, yes. and going uh, cross-country running and all that <sighs> stuff. So, so the my cube mate, the person who works in the cubicle with me, has one of these standing desks. So, oh yeah, uh, mine does too. So she actually stands up the entire day. She, I mean, she has a chair, but I've no, I don't think I've ever seen her use it. And, oh really? Uh, See, the guy who sits next to me, he has a weird chair. Like, when he does have to sit or want to sit, his chair is such that he like sits on his shins, kind of. Like he's like. Yeah, because his desk is high, right? So he can't use yeah. a regular chair. So he has this weird chair where his knees bend like only a little bit, um, and That's he kind of—it's more of like <laughs> a leaning than a sitting. But yeah, like he a has a massage stand-up chair desk. or something. I don't know. This sounds weird. Uh, oh man, I, I don't know how to describe it. But yeah, he stands all day too. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. So did so, you get a standing desk? No, I've actually been thinking about it because my desk is kind of low and I'm kind of tall. And so I was like, maybe I should get a standing desk and then like a chair that's just really high, like, you know, like a Ah. a bar chair or whatever. Um, And I was thinking that'd be pretty nice because sometimes I would like to stand up and stretch while, you know, working. So I've made a Mm -hmm. compromise and I I got an exercise ball, um, you know, like a big exercise ball. And I sit on that. And the idea being that, you know, you can kind of bounce around and you have to keep yourself stable. But I'm having to work up to it. So like, you know, the first time I like sat into it kind of too long and my back was killing me. So now yeah, I did the same thing. Did you? Uh-huh. Yeah, I sat on it. I sat on it, and uh, I was like, "I'm gonna try this out" because there's one in our in our cube, and uh, like after like about halfway through the day, around like three or four in the afternoon, like my back started really hurting, and I couldn't figure out why. Uh, and I was like, "God, it's just back pain." I don't understand. And I was like, "Wait a minute, it's this, it's this freaking ball." <laughs> yeah, I so didn't even, I didn't last, even last a day. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm working my way up. So I've slowly been sitting more and more. So I think today I sat, you know, like probably three or four hours on it and uh, did oh, okay. Nice. Like I'm not tired or sore or anything. And I'm trying to, so that's one of my things. And I've, I, I work on the fourth floor. So I've been taking the stairs up and down. I think I've only ridden the elevator twice the whole time I've been oh, there. Oh, nice. That's really so, good. So that's part of my, uh, you know, try to do better routine because I'm not playing a super extreme exercise frisbee with you. Ultimate yes, frisbee. so I just, uh, I found, uh, you know, um, at our work, they have uh, like sort of like a jungle gym for adults what? that they had just built. Yeah, this is pretty crazy. So um, they have like that climbing rope. Did you ever have that when you're in middle school? It's just like a huge rope. Oh, no, but you I know what you're kinda, talking about. Yes. Yeah, you have to kind of use your arms. They have one of those, but it's, it's, it's made of like plastic fiber instead of wool. And so... Um, it has, it gives you like the worst rug burn. So I tried Ooh. it for the first time. Yeah. And I got about halfway up the rope and I gave in. And when I, when I was coming down my hands, they just got all tore up. From and then all rope. the jocks laughed at you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I got beat up even at work. It's sad. Aww. High no. school memories all over again. <laughs> um, yeah, as they stuffed me in a trash can. It wasn't pretty, but they have like, uh, those things that have you seen these they're like platform like tables they look like tables but they're anchored into the ground and you have to sort of jump onto the table but it's really high it's like twice the height of a coffee table they actually have different sizes but the one i was on was like that Mm -hmm. and so just from standing still you have to jump onto this table and then jump off and then keep going back and forth and they had like a whole bunch of different like they had like a little demo day and i went to it and they had uh little routines that you should do to get you know more fit and stuff like that but being fit is definitely like huge over here in in california yes it is and i'm failing at it so my goal (laughs) is to to improve slightly so i can feel better about myself yeah it's like let's get all the nerds in one place and then try and get teach them to exercise (laughs) yes they put like a few Uh, non-nerd people in just to make the nerds feel bad yeah, that's right. <laughs> Let me show you how it's really done if you weren't a nerd. <laughs> uh, so, well, on to programming news. Yeah, speaking of topics. exercising, <laughs> let's exercise our processors. 
with uh, wow. with running CUDA natively on the CPU. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I know you've been uh, you've done this a little, and I've done some of this. But there's a uh, you know the new one of the new things that's come out recently is the uh, programming general purpose programming of graphics processing units so the things that are in your computers pretty much all the computers nowadays to some extent to, to run your graphics and you know accelerate anything to doing with drawing to the screen with 3d rendering like for games and all that's handled by these gpus which um, the basically come down to many core small lightweight uh, processing cores that are able to do tons of tasks in parallel. For instance, when you you know have to figure out where a triangle should show up on the screen, there's maybe millions and millions of triangles on a, in a given frame of a game, and so you can do all of those calculations uh, in parallel. And so these graphics processing units have gotten really really good at doing things in parallel. And probably yeah, the most. Sure. So I don't know. I so ATI and NVIDIA are the two big graphics processing people. And so they well, ATI, each... ATI got bought by uh, AMD. Uh, okay. But yeah. <laughs> so AMD and NVIDIA. And Intel's now uh, starting to do, well, both of them now are starting to even, Intel and AMD are starting to do interesting things with putting CPUs on, or GPUs on the CPUs directly and putting really high bandwidth connections between them. Um, so yep. that's kind of interesting. But uh, NVIDIA has a language that you use to do this general purpose programming for GPUs. And AT, uh, AMD has their own as well. But NVIDIA's is called CUDA. And um, they it's a kind of a dialect of C, which is limited. You can't do uh, a lot of the same things you might be able to do in regular C or C++. But for the most part, it's just a C program. And it runs you know, maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of threads and each one just does a little task, so massively parallel. Um, and yep. that's really good for certain operations like uh, image processing operations, graphics operations, uh, certain kinds of like simulations, like Monte Carlo simulations, where you, you know, choose random numbers and you know run a little simulation based on that random number. Things like that can be really good. The problem is that the code between what you write for a CPU and what you write for a GPU are so very different from each other. It it can almost make the expense of going through creating a separate you know code base for your CUDA programs, unless you're one of these few cases that get you know a thousand x speed up from it. It almost makes that not worth it, and it's better just to buy or pay more to get the latest and greatest CPU so that you can just have one code base. And yeah, and the other part of it too is you know the GPU you have to communicate with it. It's sort of like an external processor, you know. Whereas the CPU, it's right on board. And so because of that, debugging is much easier on the CPU. Like you could yes. take a program that's running and just stop it and say, all right, right now, what's the state of the system? Now let's process one instruction. Now where are we at? But you know because you have this GPU on a completely different card. Um, you know, the debugging becomes much more difficult. You can't do the kind of cool, hacky things that you can do, um, that debuggers do for a CPU. Right. Oh, and the other thing is that um, the the pipe between the CPU and GPU, the, the PCI Express bus, is limited in its speed. You think it's really fast, but it's really not all that fast. Um, yep. So it t there's all this overhead of sending data to the GPU to get processed and getting your results back. And so there's a, you know, crossover point where when your data gets big enough and parallel enough it makes it's worth it to send it there and get it back it's faster but below that threshold is better to do it on the CPU but if your program has dynamic you know size of data you kind of either have to have code in both and you know choose on your own which one to run or you just got to pick one or the other and suffer you know non optimal cases but what would be ideal is if you could write, for instance, just CUDA code, well, ideal would be just write C, C or C++ code and have CUDA automatically do all of this for you would be awesome. Mm -hmm. But short of that, if you could write CUDA code that when you're below a certain size limit, um, you know the overhead's too much. And so you go ahead and just run that on your um, CPU or in some case where the GPU isn't available um, so for portability reasons, to be able to run the CUDA code native on, you know, just the regular processor, the CPU would be a, yep, a, a big advantage. Or when you're doing, 
or when you're doing development, you, you want to yeah. yeah run it on the on the CPU once and make sure it works, and then run it on the GPU the rest of the time. Yeah, so that all those cases are you know really important cases, and um, it has not been something that was you know the first priority because they wanted to get this working right first, but now. It looks like um, some other people are making progress in being able to compile CUDA code down to run on x86 to enable this kind of uh, thing to take place. So it is kind of an interesting interesting article. Hopefully we'll see more of this in the future because it could be a, a, a big boon to the uh, widespread use of these uh, GPU processing paradigms. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's awesome. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of people kind of write us and they say, oh, I, want, I really like making video games, or I think somebody sent us an email uh, a little while ago and they were using, I think, Visual Basic to, to write video games. And games seem me. to be... <laughs> it was you masquerading as, as somebody else. Aww. But they, um, you know, a lot of people get into computers because of games. I mean, I, I love games. That's one of the reasons why I got into mm -hmm. computers. A lot of my friends have said, oh, the reason why I got, got into computer programming is because I want to make wanted to make games. And, uh, you know, of course, making games is really, really hard. There's a lot to it. And, you know, often it's done by teams of people. You know, back in the day, you know, when the games were on Atari and there was like four-bit graphics, uh, you know, one guy would make a whole game. But nowadays, most games are made by teams of, you know, hundreds of people. However, there is still a community of people uh, who are just single developers or small teams making games. And, and uh, one of the more popular communities is called the roguelike community. So uh, a roguelike is, is essentially it's a game derived from Rogue, which is a ASCII game made, I think, in the 70s. But... Um, the idea is it's ASCII art, so you're a little at sign and uh, you move around on the screen and the screen's made up of you know, little period signs for the floors and for the, for the floor tiles and uh, a little like the little pipe symbol and the minus sign for the walls and things like that. And so, you know, the graphics are simple, the gameplay is often quite simple. Uh, sorry, sorry. The uh, uh, <laughs> uh, mechanic, the the mechanics and the visualization, the GUI is simple, but the gameplay can become very complex, and so people can and it's typically really brutally hard. Things. Yeah, there's often really hard, or just you know the games are incredibly complex. Like Dwarf Fortress is is one of the more popular roguelikes, and you actually you know you manage a civilization, and this guy implemented an economy that kicks in. Mm -hmm. You have a king, and you have to have these nobles that have to be managed. There's an entire water system which. Um, the creator of Minecraft kind of uh, lifted, and so now you can find it in Minecraft. But at the time, Dwarf Fortress was the only game that had that kind of fluid, dynamic system. Uh, it had the 3D. It has a 3D, you know, environment where you can destroy any of the blocks. You know, kind of like Minecraft. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was the Dwarf Fortress was, is and continues to be, uh, you know, an inspiration for many other games and. Tarn Adams, the creator of Dwarf Fortress, received a ton of notoriety. And I, I know of several um, roguelike developers who got job offers from game companies just because of their involvement in, in roguelikes. So for people who want to make video games, this is a great way to get into it, uh, is, to, is to make a roguelike. And for people who want to do that, there is this website, which is how to write a roguelike in 15 steps. Um, at one point, it was a while ago, but... <laughs> I don't even remember when, but at some point I went through this, these 15 steps and made a roguelike. Oh, yeah? And yeah, and it's it's really rewarding because at the end, you know, you have a finished product and you've also learned a ton. Um, you've learned about when do I create new classes versus when do I make things data-driven. So for example, when I started, I had a sword class and then I had a flaming sword class and an ice sword class, like they're all .cpp files. Uh, and I had just all this code and no data. And I realized, you know, I don't need all this code. All I need is just a weapon class. And then I can have a little string which tells me if it's a sword or an axe or whatever. So, I mean, that was a valuable lesson as a programmer is how to make the code data driven. And, you know, I could go on and on about all the things that, that, that I learned from, from these 15 steps. But it's, it's really useful. And uh, for anyone, any kids out there who want to start making their own or video adults. games, it's a great way to start. Yeah, or adults. Yeah, now you're encouraging me to feel like I should go do this in addition to sitting on my exercise ball all day. <laughs> yeah, maybe you make a roguelike 
where the character is on an exercise ball. Or he's in an exercise ball, like a giant hamster oh. ball. Oh, yeah. Like, maybe if you go forward, like, if you go to the left too many times, the momentum of the ball like, keeps, keeps going. Keeps moving oh, you forward. Man. Yeah. That could be tough. So, to tie in the steps, you, it takes you 15 steps to, to make a roguelike, but I can have you become a good programmer in just six. Wow, six. They must be must be pretty tough steps. So, so the title of this article is actually "Become a Good Programmer in Six Really Hard Steps," and it's kind of funny because the the, the author of the article uh, actually says that the six steps should take about ten years or more. <laughs> oh, I'm nice. sorry. Actually, I think the first five steps take ten years, and then oh, okay. step six begins at the tenth year and can take possibly forever. <laughs> and it's a, a little tongue-in-cheek, but it's kind of good to go through. And it really does in the same line that you're talking about, uh, you know, learning to program games and teaching you programming because of that. This guy just kind of goes through the phases that it, people tend to go through. And therefore, if you're trying to go through it or wanting to go through it, understanding what it's going to take to get there and what it involves and, and kind of how you grow and um, what kinds of things to expect at various stages and of course everything's a little different for each person but the the same basic outline of how you go from learning your first game or doing something that inspires you to want to get into programming um, to becoming a you know software developer at a company as your job that's a pretty similar path amongst a lot of people um, they have small variations but it tends to be almost the same for many yep. people and so um, this guy's defined that pretty well and given some guidance and some help for people who are on that path yeah yeah I read it uh, and uh, yeah I thought it was I thought it was like you said very tongue-in-cheek but is uh, a lot of it is really true I mean some of it like writing your own programming language creating your own language yeah <laughs> that really kind of puts things in perspective I mean I feel like I agree that kind of everyone should do that at some point mm -hmm. just make some simple language that um, you know, all it does is let's say it, it, you can uh, pass it some new operations. Like you make a, you know, plus plus. So one plus plus two is 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 something else. Like I don't know, maybe it adds two twice. I don't know. Just something. It doesn't have to be useful, but just the experience of going through and writing a you know a parser and a and a lexer and then actually writing the interpreter and things like that is extremely useful. Definitely, definitely. So yeah, part of becoming a good programmer is being able to sort of work magic. Take things that were meant to be in one environment and bring them to a completely different environment. And Google Native Client kind of does this, where it can take programs that were meant to be you know, on your desktop and bring them to the web, actually put them inside of a browser. And it's quite amazing how it works. But uh, this uh, news article kind of talks about one specific application where this guy has taken DOSBox, which is a DOS emulator, and um, ported it to, Chrome, uh, to Google Native Client. So what you end up with is if you're using a recent enough version of Chrome, you can actually have a DOS operating system in your browser. And um, he uses this to actually let you play DOS games in the browser. So he's created like this MS DOS file system like on his server I guess and um, you can load up different games so he's got like Falcon 3.0 and TIE Fighter and X-Wing oh, and yeah he's got all these awesome old school DOS games and you just literally just go to the website as long as you're using Chrome and uh, and it's right there and you just start playing it's pretty amazing and it really kind of showcases the power of of Google Native Client. No, I want to do this right now since I'm in Chrome. Yeah, it's totally awesome. I played a little bit of Tie Fighter. Uh, he, you know, to be to be to not get in trouble or anything like that. He only has the demo. I don't even know how he got his hands on the demo of Tie Fighter. Um, he must have just had it from way back. But um, so you only can play the first level. But uh, it's still pretty amazing. And I think, you know, as part of the port, I mean, you should be able to just run anything you want like i don't know the details but it's a complete dos operating system yeah. so if you have your own tie fighter you should be able to bring it to the table i think but uh, either way it's really freaking cool sounds awesome and uh yeah you guys should check it out is it that time so now i think it's time for tool, tool of, of the, the bye week, week. <laughs> all right what do you got uh, let me guess hang on 
Is it related to what we just talked about? Uh, it's it's no. Aww. It's actually Google Native Client. <gasps> what a twist! Yeah, so my tool of the bye week is Google Native Client. I've been messing around with this, and uh, some of you might know I do a lot of work on Mame. Uh, I'm the creator of Mame Hub, which is well for people who don't know, Mame is an acronym, and it stands for Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator. But now it's grown to cover like almost every arcade machine ever made and many modern consoles, or, or not modern, many uh, retro consoles like NES, SNES, and all that. So this is sort of like the one emulator to rule them all. And I've uh, been doing a lot of development on MAME, and I'm the creator of MAME Hub, which lets you play MAME games online. So like you could play like Super Mario Brothers online with someone in England. Or you something. legally own it. That's right, as long as you legally own the cartridge yes. um, in your house. Yes. And uh, yeah, if you want, if you're in the Bay Area, you can borrow one from me. I think I still have all my Nintendo games somewhere. Anyway, so uh, I've been using Native Client for, you know, been porting MAME to it and things like that. I've been really into it. And it's just, you know, creating some sample apps. And then I can really see there's tremendous potential in this, in this, in this tool chain. Uh, it's just amazing. I mean, imagine you take something that you wrote maybe in high school or in college, or maybe it's an open source app that you really like. And, uh, you know, as long as you can get it to compile in using this native client, it runs in the browser. I mean, it's a website. And so you can, um, you know, make changes and, you know, anyone who visits your website automatically gets the latest version. You don't have to worry about deployment or anything like that anymore. Uh, you know, it lets you do awesome stuff like, uh, uh, you know, immediately get people signed in. You can sort of, uh, it, it, it has a JavaScript wrapper around your code. So you can do cool things like make Ajax requests to some web server. Uh, and so you could do all the cool web things like, you know, tap into different web services like the weather and things like that and tie all that into your desktop application really easily. So um, it's, it's it's awesome. It's uh, getting more and more popular. There's, like I mentioned in the news section, <laughs> there's some really cool demos. And uh, yeah, I'm a big fan. So I like to see what kind of cool stuff people make with it. Very cool. So, Patrick, Very what's nice. your tool of the bye week? My tool of the bye week is Handbrake, which is an open source transcoding application. And uh, it's available for Mac, Windows, and I think Linux as well. Um, but the big one is originally it was OS. It was for, for the Mac OS. And then uh, they've, they've come out with versions for for the others as well. And what this allows you to do is it's really easy for putting videos that you have permission to on your, transcoding them so that they will play on your iPhone, iPad, Android device. So, oh, um, interesting. Y- so you can take a DVD, like uh, like you can take like your wedding DVD or yes. something and, and port it to your phone? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you had a DVD of your wedding and you wanted to watch that on your tablet, then you would use this to convert it because the the tablets and phones, although they will often play a different videos, like many different kinds of videos, they're typically optimized for a certain resolution, you know, the screen size, and then also for a certain set of encoding parameters because of the fact that, you know, they have hardware acceleration to do, for instance, H.264 uh. decoding. So if you put it in that format, it's going to perform a lot better uh, or maybe not perform at all if it's not right. And what the nice thing about Handbrake is is that it has all of those presets in there. So you can just say, I want this file encoded as for an iPod Touch 3G or third gen. And so it'll do that. Or an iPhone 4, and it'll know it did it. Or I want it for an iPad. And it'll go ahead and, and choose the right width or height and ratio for you and uh, also, what encoding parameters to use, what bit rates to use. Those things that whenever you open up a video encoding thing and go, I don't even know what to choose here. Can I please get some like auto button? It kind of has for you. And so you can just say what device you want to encode for. And it'll just kind of uh, already have the presets in there. Oh, that's really awesome. That is a fantastic tool. I've never seen this tool before. Oh, no. I'm definitely going to oh, use it. Yeah. yeah. And it has, it supports a wide range of inputs. Um, so it's pretty nice. It's just one of those things where it almost always works and that's nice. It's nice to have a tool where it's not like you got to have 15 different things to be able to do one task. Yeah, it's pretty. And you know, this really sort of sets a precedent now that you've 
use an open source tool and not uh, as your um, yes <laughs> as your tool of the bye week yeah this is the first time in a while i've been doing closed source tools for the last uh, few episodes and uh, yeah i'm back on the try to do open source not just free <laughs> we haven't nice. done any paid tools yet though so yeah i don't think so i think i think you're right that we've never done a paid tool that's because there's no paid tools that are any good I won't say that. <laughs> you may say that, sir. I won't say that. <laughs> there are certain people who want to charge for their applications often have very good reasons for doing so, and they are more than entitled to try that. Fair enough. So, okay. <laughs> enough philosophy. <laughs> Time for the discussion of our programming language of the week, Lisp. That's right. Lisp is, is the language we're going to be talking about. It's, it's really interesting. It's... um. Definitely, if you're into computer science and uh, sort of the understanding, like you know, the history and sort of the more, I guess, the less hands-on, the more kind of pie-in-the-sky theory and things like that, this is a good language to know. Um, it was actually invented before it was implemented. So someone, and do we have the person's name? Let me see. John McCarthy, uh, back in 1958. So this was a very old language. He... Um, he kind of formalized this idea of Lisp and sort of the the, the core functions um, that constitute the Lisp language, and sort of proved that Lisp is Turing complete and things like that. Um, and before there was even an implementation, I mean, this was just all done in paper. As it, was a, it was a thought experiment, right? And uh, it wasn't until uh, much later, actually, I guess a few years later, that. Um, da -da 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 -da. Steve Russell uh, created the first Lisp implementation. So, um, yeah, so Lisp has a wide history. Because Lisp is so tied to computer science, um, there's just tons of different dialects of Lisp. Uh, you know, there's, there's it Scheme seems to be, and things like that. It seems to be probably the, uh, how do you say it's like the most well-known, least used programming language. Like, people use yep. it, but not... Every day, like people don't use it in their everyday jobs, but it seems like everybody who goes through computer science learns it, or even people who are just interested in computer programming will pick it up and they'll at least play with it, if not learn to be experts in it, you know, at least know it, but then not use it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of the, the problems with Lisp, and we could, we'll talk about this more in the weaknesses, but is that it's just, it's so fragmented, right? I mean, this isn't really a problem with Lisp as much as just the, just I guess the social sort of uh, just the events that transpired but Lisp is so fragmented there's many different compilers for Lisp or interpreters I should say and uh, you know there's so many different dialects and for a long time none of the interpreters were open source so um, you know each one sort of had its own nuances and mm -hmm. and so this is I feel like this is really kind of plagued Lisp but um, the two things that are sort of critical to Lisp are um, CAR and CUDR, so C-A-R and C-D-R. And the way this works is, uh, think of everything in Lisp as being a pair, and the pair is actually called CONS, C-O-N-S. So, so you have a pair of objects, um, but the objects themselves, they could be anything. And to, to, get, to go from a pair to the specific like, elements in the pair, like the first and the second, you'd call car to get at the first, or you'd call cooter to get at the second. And so just with cons, car, and cooter, uh, that forms the basis for the entire Lisp language. Uh, it's, a lot of it's based on lambda calculus, which gets into some uh, pretty heavy stuff. Uh, basically, lambda calculus is sort of a formalism. You know, we talked about first-order predicate calculus. We were talking about um, prolog. And uh, so this is just another way of sort of representing numbers and the computations on those numbers. And you can read about it more on Wikipedia, but, but understand that similar to Prolog, Lisp is sort of based on, um, on calculus. And so because of that, you can imagine it's not something you're going to write you know, device drivers for, right? So this is something that's kind of very theoretical. Um, however, there have been Lisp machines 
Uh, have you heard anything about this? Yeah, yeah, well, I it was a little bit before my time, I guess, although uh, maybe I was still quite young when some of it was going on. But the <laughs> List Machines was kind of an effort when the personal computers were first uh, coming out to have a machine that was for individual users, which although didn't directly implement Lisp, so there weren't ma assembly level commands that said, you know, the parts of the Lisp language directly, what it did was provide a really simple stack-based processor as opposed to a register-based processor, which uh, I guess gets pretty uh, in-depth and probably outside the scope for this discussion. But instead of register-based, it was stack-based, and the commands themselves were meant to be uh, very easily derived by Lisp code. So it was a Lisp code would translate into very few instructions as opposed to on a normal uh, register based CPU, for instance, the list, a single Lisp command may take many, many machine instructions t to implement. And so these, this processor architecture was put together in something called a Lisp machine that was meant to be easily programmed and efficient at writing and using and running Lisp programs. Right. So, I mean, you know, think about the difference between, say, C and Lisp. So in C, you know, just from a data perspective, in C you're dealing with arrays and pointers that, that point to different spots of memory. And so you do pointer arithmetic. So, for example, if you have an array and you want to loop through the array, um, you would, you know, have a pointer at the beginning of the array and then you sort of increment. It's very numerical. You, you just say, I want to push my pointer a little bit further and read the data over here and then push it further. Kind of like you'd read off a tape or a record or something like that. Um, in Lisp, you don't have arrays. What you have are, as Lists. I mentioned, these pairs. Yeah, so you, you have pairs. So if you want to have, say, a list, if you want to have an array, let's say, in Lisp, then what you would have is you'd have a pair. The left, The first element in the pair would have some item in your list. Let's say it's a list of numbers. So the first element in your pair would have the number, say four. And the second element of your pair would have a pair in it. <laughs> and then that pair, the first element would have a number, let's say two. And the second element would have another pair. So you see everything is done in pairs and uh, any of the, el the two elements in the pair can be either an atom, which is you know a number or a word or you know something uh, something that's immutable, something that can't change, like a constant, right? Or it's either a constant, or it's it's another pair, or it's nil. Those are your three. Those are the only three, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things that can exist. So as we mentioned in JavaScript, where there was only four things, uh, in JavaScript there's nil, uh, you know, array, object, and literal. In Lisp, there's only atom, which is the same as literal, a uh, pair and nil. There's only three. So, you know, you would think that because it's so simple that, oh, you know, you must be like really low level, like you must use this for drivers because it's such a simple language. But actually making the language very simple is really what gives it the power and gives it the um, the ability to represent incredibly complex things. And we'll, I'll talk about this a little more when we get to the strengths. But um, understand that, you know, a machine, a regular machine that just has a bank of memory where you can just do malloc and get arrays. That kind of machine doesn't run Lisp very efficiently, especially you know 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So the l idea of the Lisp machine was let's make a machine with the constraints of Lisp in mind. Let's make mm -hmm. a machine that deals with things in terms of pairs. Right. And I I I, th I mean it seems like they were fairly successful at doing that. It was just that the competition and the market was somewhere else it was in the traditional register based machines running c and yeah so I, it seems like there have been many of these instances in the even short-lived uh software world where even if something made sense or was technically superior it won out something else won out because of just market inertia or you know happenstance or various other things and you know the list machine kind of fits in that category Yep. Yeah, I'd like to think that, you know, being an AI person and and being sympathetic to Lisp, I would I like to think that it's sort of the grandfather of many other languages. Like 
you know, other languages like Python, JavaScript, which, you know, is based on, uh, JavaScript was based on Scheme, right? It was inspired it was by Scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Scheme is a dialect of Lisp, so there you go. And, and you know, even MATLAB, which is now very popular, uh, you know, you know, Lisp is sort of the grandfather of all interpreted languages and is, is a good source of sort of inspiration for, for languages that came after and offered, you know, much uh, more uh, boosts in productivity, uh, you know, without all of the hindrances that Lisp has. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so as we mentioned, as many dialects, um, but uh, one of the reasons why there's so many dialects is because it's, it's really easy to write an interpreter or a compiler for Lisp. In fact, you know, as we mentioned with the, uh, you know, uh, become a good programmer in six really <laughs> hard steps, uh, the the author even mentions that hey, you should write a Lisp interpreter as one of the as your language, you know, because it's a good start. Yeah, there's so few things you actually. Well, I mean, it seems seems tricky at the start. It seems so easy to get started because there's so few things you have to implement. Yeah, and and keep in mind that. And this is true for all languages. I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but most languages are written in themselves. So and we've, we have talked about this where, you know, we talked about Python being batteries included, where there's a, a huge corpus of, of, of uh, tools that you have that are um, available to you when you start programming. The vast majority of those tools are written in Python. Uh, this is true even of, you know, C and Lisp and other languages, just to a lesser extent. So, you know, 99% of Lisp is written in Lisp. And, uh, you know, if you could take, like, the common Lisp libraries and, and you know, use your own interpreter, you could really have your own Lisp, like, fully featured interpreter in, in a day. I mean, of course, it wouldn't be fast. It'd be <laughs> nothing like C-Lisp. But, uh, but, but, you know, it still would be, uh, would be fun. You know, it's a toy to play with. And it seems like the other thing is that the... There are a lot of people who take Lisp and use it as kind of a, a intermediate language where you write something in Lisp and then you compile. Like we talked about uh, people doing this to JavaScript before, but people kind of use Lisp as an input language to the compiler, I guess, and then compile it to some other form of a language. So um, there's Clojure which is C-L-O-J-U-R-E, as opposed to, <laughs> we talked a little bit about the Clojure kit tools uh, last week, or last yep. episode, um, and that is uh, implementing Lisp on top of Java, so using the Java virtual machine and, and using Lisp as kind of, I, I guess, what is at the front end to it, and saying, yeah, nice. how, do we, how do we do that? And it's, it's got a lot of popularity. Um, and there's also the... Everybody kind of has their own little ways about some of the finer nuances of the language. And so each of those tends to kind of get its own spin out dialect, which initially starts out really close to the one it started from, but then slowly drifts away over time. Yep. Yeah, so some of the strengths of Lisp. Um, one of the strengths is that it has very, very efficient hash tables. And um, this is. This is tied directly to the fact that there's so few data types. Um, you know, it does a lot of sort of like clever tricks with the um, with the with the pairs, and and uh, it can actually store a ton of data in a hash table very efficiently um, by sort of reusing the same data. Lisp is amazing at this. Um, well, we should so you, we should explain okay. what a hash table is. Oh yeah, you've probably never done that. So yeah, so a hash table is something that essentially maps one uh, data type to another. So, or w one value? Yeah. yeah, I guess one, yeah, one value, maybe that's a better way of saying it, essentially maps one value to another. So, for example, um, let's say you wanted uh, to store the days of the week. So, if you put in you know, zero, you got Monday. If you put in one, you got Tuesday, right? So in C, you could just have an array. And uh, at the array index zero, you just hold the string, a pointer to the string Monday. And one, you'd hold Tuesday, so on and so forth. And then you'd say, you know, days, open bracket, you know, two to get, to get Wednesday, right? Um, what if you wanted to go backwards? Like, what if someone gave you the string and you wanted to return what day of the week it was 
in numbers. So if someone gave you Monday, you want it to return zero. So in this case, you'd have to use you'd have to use essentially a map, and the map would have to map strings to numbers. See, an array you can think of an array as a map, which maps numbers to something else, whatever's in the array. Um, but whenever you need to map uh, something that isn't a number, let's say you need to map you know a floating point number or as I mentioned a string, or maybe you need to map a chessboard, like the entire board, like a whole class with the pieces and where they are. You need to map that to a number. Um, for to do something like that, you have to use uh, a map. And one very common map implementation of a map is a hash table. What a hash table does is it uh, takes it basically is based on the principle that you don't actually need the key. So in other words, I don't actually need to store the string Monday in this table. You know, what what I need is when I get the string Monday, I need to know to return zero. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I need to hold Monday in the table. So that sounds a little confusing, but take for example, uh, let's say that your hash table, instead of storing the whole string, it just stored the first two letters. So that would be sufficient, right? If someone passed in Monday, then I would just take the first two letters, M-O, and just look for that in the table. And uh, that, would, that would return zero. And I've saved some data. I didn't have to store all of Monday. Now, you know, I couldn't use one letter, because if I did, then Tuesday and Thursday uh -oh. would both map to the same location. That's called a collision. Uh, collision. Right. And so there's ways to deal with that even. So it's not the end of the world. But, you know, I could store two letters and save a lot of data. And um, so so hash tables, you know, it it's um, there's a lot to it. Um, you know, if you're really good at hash tables, hash tables are sort of the backbone of just about everything in computer science, especially distributed processing or, you know, web and stuff like that. So it would take a whole show. But in a nutshell, um, you know, Lisp and the way Lisp works, uh, the objects in Lisp are very hash friendly. And uh, on top of that, Lisp can do a lot of um, object reuse. So it can implement hash tables very efficiently, very quickly. It can uh, implement them without using a lot of memory. And uh, this is really important for the applications, which we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. So do you have any other strengths for Lisp? Yeah, so one thing that, well, I guess this is one of those, it could be a strength and could be a weakness, is that <laughs> you can use Lisp to parse itself. So the difference between data and instructions in a C++, Java, Python program is very clear. It's very much, here's my code and here's the data I'm storing. Um, I'm assigning this data to this variable. And only in a few kind of edge cases where you might talk about um, function pointers or you know some kind of obscure things where your variable stores a pointer to code or code somewhere. But that isn't, isn't the usual case. It doesn't normally happen. But in Lisp, mm -hmm. you can have your, your program is represented as, one, as, as these pairs. So you can, this, this is very easy to intermix both the data and the program. And that means that you can manipulate the program. So that's known as self-modification. So when the code as it's running changes the code that's running, and in Lisp, this is easy to do because the, like I said, there's no real distinction between data and the program. And yep. that's a strength. That gives you, there's some really powerful techniques that you can do and that make really efficient code. Um, it also happens to be something that can be very hard to understand, um, but it, it, it's one of those with great power comes great responsibility. If you use <laughs> yeah, it wisely, right. it can be very powerful. Um, and if you use it poorly, it can cause problems. Um, but Lisp yeah, is really I mean, good look at, at doing that. Look at like the roguelike, for example. So let's say you're making a simple roguelike game following the 15 steps. And uh, you, know, you make a sword. Uh, and uh, you, know, you have this sword class. And you have some data. Like you have the great sword, where the name is great. And um, it does like 10 damage. And then you have like the awesome sword. So you have some text file. And the text file just has, you know, great sword, comma, 10, awesome sword, comma, 20, uh, you know, 
light sword comma 30 and so like then you write some C program that lo looks at your text file and then says okay create you know and then create a great sword create an awesome sword and then put these in somewhere in memory so that I can fill my world full of great and awesome swords but what if I wanted a flaming sword and when you hit somebody with it um, they caught on fire and there was all this code and stuff like that well you know that can't really go in the text file you know i mean you can't describe like would, the flames yeah you can't describe the flames and the effect and the person catching on fire and what that means all that logic you can't just put that in the text file i mean you know you'd have to put it in the c file and then know that oh a flaming sword has this right but with lisp you can just your data and your code is the same thing so you're you would have in Lisp, you would have you know a pair, and the pair, the first element would be the name, and the second element would be a pair, which would have the you know a damage, and then you know the third element there could be an entire oh. Lisp program, which is what happens when you hit someone with the sword, and uh, you don't have to worry about reading your data from the text file like you do in C and like, you know, creating sword objects based on the data in the text file. You just load that Lisp file and it's done. Um, so yeah, you could do some awesome stuff with it. But yeah, I mean, it makes it very difficult to debug and and uh, and things like that, so. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of a wild thing that you have at your fingertips. <laughs> so with all of the, th these things are nice features, the everything's a pair and th and there's the language provides some abstraction so I guess we should say that that even though everything under the hood is a pair um, the languages allow you to not have to literally if you want to make a list have you know a pair where the second element is another pair and the second element is another <coughs> is another pair they give you the power to um, just you know make one long list and do that pairing for you um, yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, I was just thinking about that because one of the weaknesses, though, that even with that, um, Lisp tends to have a ton of parentheses, and parentheses are what are used to kind of wrap each pair. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, you know they've done a lot to to make it less painful. So as Patrick mentioned, if you have ten items, you can just put a single parentheses around them, and Lisp under the hood knows that it's like a bunch of pairs that are all chained together. Uh, but the fact is, yeah, I mean, there's just, you're dealing with pairs. And, and uh, as you might imagine, there's a, as a lot of, there's a lot of data, a lot of variables you might have in your code. Um, you're going to have a ton of parentheses. Um, that's kind of uh, endemic of Lisp programs. So <laughs> fortunately, if you use Emacs, uh, you can, uh, it, it'll match up the, or actually, I guess most modern, uh, or not even modern, most editors will do this for you but it'll help you match up the parentheses um, but yeah it's still it still can make things a little cumbersome yeah it's not really a weakness but it is something when people look at Lisp code some languages you don't exactly know at first like C++ and Java sometimes you have to kind of look at certain lines of code to kind of understand what it is when you look at Lisp code it's really easy to tell because you just look for all the parentheses <laughs> yeah I mean think about this um, you know, as we mentioned again, everything's a pair. So if you want to add two numbers, what you really want, you want a pair of a plus sign and then a pair of a two and a three underneath it. So you have now Lisp with Lisp with C Lisp and more advanced Lisp, you can take away the parentheses around the two and a three. But you're going to have a parentheses and then the plus sign and then two and three. Um, that's another thing about Lisp is that it, everything is in prefix notation. So if you want to do 2 plus 3, you actually want to do plus 2, 3. <laughs> and so the, because it's in prefix, let's say you wanted to do uh, 2 plus 3 minus 4. It would actually be plus minus 2, 3, 4. So now that doesn't make any sense, right? Because the order of operations, you don't really know. You know, prefix notation doesn't really give you order of operations. So to deal with all that, you specify the order explicitly. So to do 2 plus 3 minus 4, you'd actually do open parentheses, open parentheses, minus sign, or uh, yeah, I think yeah you said minus that. sign, <laughs> open parentheses, plus sign 2, 3, close parentheses, 4, close parentheses. Yeah. So just to do something that simple, you already needed four parentheses, like two opening and two closing. So 
it can get pretty cumbersome. Um, but one of the other you know weaknesses of Lisp beyond just the syntax is that uh, it doesn't have direct memory access and and doesn't really have much in the way of hardware access. So people have written extensions, but uh, you know for the most part it's not really designed to uh, you know fit the model of a computer. And this is one of the you know things that really hurt Lisp. And that's you know that's what inspired people to make the Lisp machines that they did you know 20 30 years ago. Yeah, um, and that's really fundamental being able to at, manipulate specific memory locations because that's at you know for for people who've never done it before it may not be obvious but that's how at the lowest le level all the drivers work. So the things that control hardware all come down to basically putting certain values at certain memory locations. And right. doing that causes something to happen electrically on that peripheral device. Um, and that's how device drivers are written. And so if you don't have the ability to control exactly what the contents of a certain memory location are, then you're not going to be able to control that device. And you can't write device drivers. And um, that's what a lot of low-level code is working with those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people are probably too young. A lot of people listening to the show are too young to have serial mouse. But when I started learning about computers, I had a serial mouse and... Uh, what that was was you know, the the plug for the mouse had how much does a serial port have like eight pins I think nine. or sixteen as nine, nine pins yeah really nine that's a weird or number. a mouse Anyways. no or just a regular serial port no this isn't a PS2 this is like an old serial mouse I think like, it was even before my port. time but then yeah then that was <laughs> nine pins okay yeah so so and each so so just think of that it has nine pins and you know it's it naturally fits an array. You know, if you want the eighth pin, then you call array index seven, right? So, I mean, the way that computers are architected and built, you know, the way memory is laid out, all of these things sort of fit the linear, you know, C model. And, you know, back when it was really important, when speed was really important before computers got as fast as they were, and when, you know, storage was really important before hard drives got as cheap as they are now, um, the you know, languages like C just completely dominated, and um, only now are people starting to leverage more uh, like productivity-focused languages like Python. But Lisp was really sort of uh, only you know useful to academics at the time when uh, it was most popular. So you already kind of mentioned that Lisp is used a lot in the artificial intelligence community. What kinds of things do you guys use it for? Yeah. So. Um, so Lisp was very was used a lot in uh, planning, and so let me explain a little bit of what planning is. Planning is basically uh, searching through like a particular space and figuring out sort of what are the optimal actions to take. So, for example, uh, path planning is you know you, let's say you have again let's say you're making a roguelike game and you have this grid world. Uh, you know, sort of like a where the whole world is just a grid of numbers. You're at coordinate x. You're at you're at you know coordinate three comma five, and then you take a step to the left. Now you're at coordinate four comma five. It's very discreet, right? And so, you know, you want to navigate through some maze in this grid world. What you want to do is to plan. You want to sort of try all the possible moves you can make. And then see where you are. Are you closer to the goal? Are you further away from the goal? Like, what's the state of the world after after these different actions I could take? Mm -hmm. So, again, going back to list strengths, right? Let's you can create a hash table where the key is the entire world, um, the state of the world as it is. So, so in this grid world, the key might be just your position, um, and the value would be. Um, you know how close you are to the goal, uh, or maybe even just you want the hash table to store as a key the state of the world and as a value whether you've seen this state or not. So, if I take a step to the left, that's a new state. So I'll put that in the hash table, and then let's say I try taking a step to the right. Well, that puts me in the same state I started at. So I go to my hash table. I say, hey, here's some new world I discovered. This is the world where I'm at coordinate four comma five, and the hash table says, "No, you've already been here before. Like, don't bother trying to go further. 
Like you've already tried all the actions when you're at four comma five. And so doing this will keep you from just going left, right, left, right, left, right. You know, so <laughs> eventually you'll explore all of the possible game states, um, all the possible world states until you get to the state where you're at the goal. Um, now to take it to the next level, the hash table could not only say whether you've been at that state before, but it could say how you got there. So, you know, once you get to the goal, you can say, okay, this state of the world that I visited or that I'm at now, how did I get here? Check the hash table. The hash table will say, oh, you got here by making a move to the right. So you could do the opposite, backtrack, right? Make a move to the left and say, this state of the world, how did I get here? And it could say, oh, you got here by moving down, so on and so forth. So this is planning. And to, to do effective planning, you need good heuristics, which um, that's just simple algebra. So you can do heuristics in any language. But you need an awesome hash table. And Lisp definitely gives you that. So um, it was very useful for planning. Um, expert systems, it was also good at this. This is kind of a buzzword. Expert systems is basically planning. But um, instead of planning over something very discrete, like as we mentioned, planning through a grid world or something like that, in the case of expert systems, you're planning uh, over rules. So this is uh, similar to Prolog. Actually, this is almost exactly Prolog, yeah. but at a lower <laughs> level, yeah. So you know, in the case of Prolog, it's this really high-level abstract language where you're specifying these rules. Um, in the case of Lisp, sort of, you would be creating the Prolog interpreter, essentially, in Lisp. But you could also do other low-level things, like you could have rules that were mathematically based. Um, you do things like that. And so a mathematically based rule system which parsed um, natural language, it basically tokenized the languages, uh, the natural, tokenized the text into syllables, and then based on the syllables tried to get an understanding for the language, like where the noun is in the sentence, where the verb is. Um, there's a system that did this called Shurdlu, S-H-R-D-L-U, and it really made Lisp famous. So what this guy did, he was able to um, scan an entire encyclopedia, and then for each sentence, he was able to figure out where the noun, the verb, the object of the preposition, all the different parts of speech for that sentence. And then he created a hash table for um, each sentence where the key was the, uh, I believe the key was the verb, and the value was the noun, something like that. But basically, because he scanned the entire encyclopedia, you could ask it questions like, uh, how many toes or how many legs does a zebra have? And it actually could tell you answers in English. So you would literally type in, how many legs does a zebra have? And it would answer you, a zebra has four legs in English. And this, this blew people's mind, right? Um, when this program came out, people thought, OK, you know, we're going to get a human robot in the next five years. <laughs> now, this program came out like in the 60s, right? Uh, or maybe not that late, maybe like the 70s. But, I mean, you know, it shocked, like it rocked the AI community. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was done by Lisp. And it really made Lisp uh, very popular at the time. Another thing that people use Lisp for, and you, you talked about it a little before, but uh, Emacs, yep. uh, you mentioned that it will help you do the parentheses matching, which a lot of editors will do, but Emacs um, uses a version of Lisp as a way to do its ex extending the Emacs editor. So the Emacs is one of the... Uh, I don't even want to say anything because it'll just start a flame war, <laughs> but uh, Emacs is one of the editors that is popular on the Linux platform, and, I'll uh, say it e is able e Emacs is the best editor um, for the Linux platform, and also all right. E the only thing that might be better is X Emacs. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything because I I want to not have my email inbox completely filled with I, people writing in about this. Yeah, I have a feeling the guy who sits at the stand up desk um, will be kicking my ass tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> and he has uh, a very so, strong but, leg because he's been standing on it all day. He's just standing all time. <laughs> No, he'll rest on the chair first, the leaning chair, yeah, for a few minutes. That's right. And then he'll yeah. and then he'll kick me down. Um, so Emacs allows you the option to uh, in add functionality and increase its abilities by writing in a form of Lisp in one of the Lisp dialects. Right. And that's a a very popular use of the Lisp language. Yeah, definitely. Also, the um, 
uh, I guess it's the what's the ITA stand for? It's like international I don't traffic. Know what ITA stands for, but Google now owns them. But they were kind of yeah, like the big back end infrastructure servers for they're like all of the major internet travel websites like Orbit, Travelocity, that went and queried a system for tickets, information, flight paths, times, uh, on time percentages, those kinds of things. These people like tracked all of that data. They were like the people who all these websites used to, to get that information from. And all of their software was written in Lisp. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I think, you know, they were pro they've probably been around for a long time. Um, yes. And they, yeah. uh, you know, probably when they were around, other languages like Python and things like that probably weren't that popular or maybe even didn't exist. And so they were, you know, had the foresight to... Um, jump on a productivity based you know productivity focused language like lisp and so it's carried them all the way to today so definitely lisp has been used in, in enterprise solutions another more academic application of lisp that was very popular again at the time was maxima which is a computer algebra system so um you know algebra really is a planning problem you know especially at a higher level like you think about it you you, you have an equation Let's say you have, uh, like, let's say a simple equation, like you have, uh, you know, 4 divided by 2 plus 3, and you just want to know the answer to that. So, you know, that's, you're doing, you have to do planning. In this case, you only have one thing you can do, which is the division, because of order of operations. So you divide the 4 by the 2, that's your one action. Now you're into a new state, where you have 2 plus 3. Then you take another action, where you combine those, and you get 5. But as you get to more advanced things, especially like integrals where there's many different rules you can use or derivatives or you get to differential equations where there's, there's, there's you know, 10, if not 15 or 20 different ways you can solve a particular ODE, um, particular differential equation. So um, this thing does planning and says, all right, again, let's here's the state of the world. It's this differential equation. Um, let's put it in a hash table, and then let's start trying different rules, different ODE, um, different uh, differential equation solvers, and uh, it can um, <clears throat> it can sort of try these rules, and by enacting these rules on the equation, it creates a new equation, and that's a new entry in the hash table. And the hope is eventually it can reduce some really complex differential equation into something much simpler. Or it can reduce some integral using some trig identity into something much simpler. So uh, Maxima used planning to uh, to solve many computer algebra problems. All right. Well, I think that that wraps it up. Yeah. So so yeah, the uses were pretty cool. The Maxima computer algebra system, the ITA software, Emacs AI. This was has been used for some pretty awesome things, and uh, it's also very interesting to learn. So. Uh, Definitely take a look at it and uh, stay tuned. Yeah, I've said that before, said this before, but uh, it, Lisp is one of those languages where learning it, even if you don't use it in your day-to-day -day job or don't ever become super amazingly proficient at it, uh, it's one of those things that will help you become a better programmer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, you know, if uh, a couple of people have been adding us to um, on Google+, that's awesome. Definitely add us. Uh, we actually invited... The uh, uh, anyone I knew from programming throwdown for my programming throwdown circle, we invited to the hangout. Um, so definitely, you know, can take some of your questions and your feedback directly uh, when we do the shows and things like that, which would be which would be awesome. So um, you have to try that out, us, but see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but shoot us an email. Uh, just so add uh, my uh, my name on uh, plus is uh, jgmath2000 at gmail.com. And uh, I think you're P. Wheeler, uh, right? Patrick L. W. Oh, sorry. Patrick L. W. at gmail.com is Patrick. Um, shoot us an email, uh, you know, before you add us to your circles so that we know that, that you know, you're in programming throwdown and we know kind of uh, that you're not some spam bot or something like that. Although, you know, spam really has been brought to quite a minimum on G+, yeah, which I is pretty cool. haven't seen too much of it. But, yeah, just in case, shoot us an email, let us know. Uh, you know, give us some love. Yeah, for uh, all of you who have added me, I know some people have, uh, and I haven't added you back. I I'm working out a system. I'm trying to keep my stream 
with people that like I'm really trying to pay attention to, and I still haven't figured out how to add people and then not you know have them flood out my normal stream. But I have been looking at what you write on my incoming stream, so don't feel like uh, that I'm j I'm I'm being mean to you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm gonna keep uh, inviting anyone in my programming throwdown circle to the hangout before you record. Um, so if you have any feedback you want to add, or if you have any questions, or if you have a language, we'll do a we'll do an impromptu language. I'll throw down the gauntlet right now and say that if someone has the right timing to jump into our hangout um, while we're recording the podcast, we will do whatever language they want. Well, um, I, will, I, will, I will make it that if they are willing to come on the podcast, if we don't know anything about it and, and do at least part of the spiel of it. Yeah, that's true. We, we need some help. If someone comes in and says, oh, I want you to do Motorola assembly at buy, you know, I mean, then we can't, we're kind of stuck, right? Um, or I want you to do M68K, you know, Donkey Kong assembly or something. <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, yeah, you definitely have to be willing to help out, help us out because we're, we're going to be floundering a little bit. But I will throw down the gauntlet now and say we'll do any language someone wants if they jump in the hangout. Jason and might be us. doing it by himself. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, shoot us an email. Let us know so that we know who you are. And uh, um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that would be awesome. And uh, definitely check out the blog, programmingthrowdown.blogspot.com. And our email address is programmingthrowdown at gmail.com. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I guess until two weeks from now, have a good one. Stay safe and learn you some lists for great good. All right. Take care. See ya. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.